All right, a couple of clarifications. Um, if you've been trying to pick up on the signs that my wife was using, and you think you have it all figured out, then that last one in the last session, um, you know, I couldn't pick up the sign. I didn't know if she was trying to tell me to bun or what. But uh, when I got through, she said, put your left britcher leg down. It, caught, it was caught up, caught up in my sock. And so uh, uh, that's what that was about. I, I, didn't, I couldn't figure it out. And so finally she just laughed about it, and I laughed too. And uh, I could understand why. Um, I was glad they were filming it so I had to stand still because if I'd been walking around, you would not have heard a word I said on the subject. But that's what that sign was about. And now we've kind of added that to the repertoire. Next time I'll know, uh, I'll know what that's about. The other is the blinking of the lights. Um, the president said, of uh, the school, by the way, not the president, but uh, the president said that the lights are kind of on sensors. And so if we sit still for, for very long, it, it thinks the gymnasium is empty. And so, that bank of light goes out. Um, so if I start going like this, you know I'm just kind of keeping the lights on for you. And uh, uh, I'm not real huge on gestures, but that's kind of the way that works. All right, this particular session, we're going to be um, addressing uh, social anxiety and panic attacks. Um, before we get into this particular section, we were... Uh, Denise and I were talking during the break and um, uh, emphasizing the changes that had to take place and how we as caring people want to be there for folks in the hospital and when tragic things happen and boy it's just painful and not to be able to do that. Uh, a number of years ago uh, my uh, uh, grandson who was nine years old at the time was killed in an automobile accident and so they uh, he was flown to Grand Junction, Colorado, and my granddaughter was flown to uh, Denver, Colorado, and so uh, my grandson passed away, and so uh, my son and I made it over to, uh, to Denver. So we were there for weeks, and uh, Neil and uh, Kathy came by and kind of assessed things. You're just kind of dealing with what's next. You know, you're just uh, waiting for the next doctor to come out and waiting for the next report on whether our granddaughter is going to live or not. But they kind of assess things and they brought in what we needed and provided it. You know, that was just absolutely unspeakably helpful. But you just can't make those decisions. You just, you don't have the wherewithal to do it. And I'm not telling you that to feel sorry for us because my grandson's okay. You know, you and I are still struggling, but he's okay. That, uh, that part I'm not emphasizing. Here's what I'm emphasizing is. Uh, they, as, as Christians, were able to look the way we do, as caring people, as friends, to say, this needs to be taken care of, we'll take care of it. And just taken care of. We couldn't do that during COVID. As caring as Neil and his family were, as compassionate as Kathy is, they would have just had to suffer at home, worried about the Martin. And guess what the Martins wouldn't have been able to do? We wouldn't have been at the hospital with our granddaughter, and our daughter-in-law, and our, our son in their very tragic time. So we've experienced those things. We're the beneficiary of, of our compassion and our care, and when that's shut off, when we're separated from it, it's caused us to have anxiety like we have never, ever experienced before. Because we can't be who we want to be when we need to be those people. But we wanted to share that with you just so you know that we know the context. And we can't do those kind things under these circumstances. So now that we've learned that, we want to be more aware of those who deal with it on a daily basis. When you think about social anxiety, <clears throat> that's the excessive fear of social situations that would expose one to scrutiny. Symptoms usually last 
six months or more. You notice when we get into these disorders, there's a pattern to it. You don't just have a feeling. Uh, you don't just kind of get locked up at the moment because you put in a, a situation that's immediately uncomfortable to you. But this happened for at least six months where you have that kind of feeling in that kind of situation. You wouldn't think this would be true because I grew up in a large family. So you wouldn't think I'd have social anxiety, you know, that I've always been in a group. I've never, ever been by myself. It just never happened. Wouldn't know what that felt like. Uh, but uh, because of that, you know, plenty of people talking, and so it got down to me. I, I'm the kind of person that I watch the older siblings. And since I'm number eight, I knew what not to do. <laughs> they did some things that it didn't turn out too well for them. Thought, okay, mark that off my list. That's not going to happen. And there were some other things they did, and they got bragged on, and uh, accolades for and I thought, okay, that may be something you ought to pay attention to. So I could do all that from a distance without ever really being socially engaged. So I was a very bashful person. So bashful that I took a zero in my high school speech class and my speech teacher just begged me, said, get up and say anything. Uh, I've got to give you a zero if you don't say anything. Just get up and say anything so it doesn't destroy your grade. And I said, I'm not getting up there. Because everybody's just sitting there like you are. And you're looking at me and the lights are going to go off in a minute because you're not doing anything to look at me. And I just thought, I'll pass out. There's not any way in the world I can do that. And I took the zero. I have wished a thousand times that I had looked up Miss Frost <laughs> and said, you're not going to believe this because every waking moment of my life now I'm engaged in some kind of social setting. Either teaching classes online, counseling with folks, working within a congregation, speaking at seminars like this, and so I know what it feels like to have social anxiety. Let me tell you the first time that I, I spoke publicly. We had a, just a loving congregation. I grew up, we had elders that I really admired. My father not really being part of the picture. They were kind of my spiritual fathers. And um, so the last Wednesday night of the month, they would have... Uh, two of the young men that would get up and deliver a, a message. Instead of having Bible classes, they were trying to train the young men to, uh, to, to speak publicly. And so you had a, a month or so to prepare for it, and then you had 15 minutes apiece, you know, really 10 minutes apiece, but they told you 15 minutes. And so we walked out of the Bible class one Wednesday night, we were standing out front, and I felt the warmth of this elder's um, hand on my back and he said brother Jerry you'll be one of our speakers next month won't you and I heard coming out of my mouth yes sir and where that came from I do not know I didn't have any trouble telling Miss Frost no I will not speak and I said yes sir and then more for the next month, I just picture myself standing up for that congregation. And I just get weak need. And my brother-in-law, the one I told you about that died uh, from COVID, um, my sister's older than I am, and so uh, he would practice with me. He helped me put the outline together, and I'd preach to him, and, and he'd time me, you know, at 15 minutes. I mean, I had it down 15 minutes on the money. I mean, it was perfect. And he had to, all right, now look at me. And we'd go through this, you know, and all right, it's, it's not going to take, but just it'd be over before you know it. So we get up there, and uh, it's time to go. And I'm the first one. And I thought, I want to do it first, and we get over with. And, uh, and so I, I get up there in the pulpit, and I got my little suit on, you know. And, and then we had, we didn't have these, these microphones like this that you can walk around a little bit. They had a little round lapel mic that was wired to the pulpit. 
And so it wasn't very long. I mean, they, they didn't have a whole lot of walking preachers back like then because a little short area up there. And so uh, it was wired. And so they get it on me, you know, and I'm, I'm standing up there. And uh, I look up one time. Oh, my. Everybody's looking at me. Now, most of them are smiling, you know, but it doesn't matter to me whether they're smiling or not. They're looking at me. And so I looked down at my outline, and I started reading. I didn't present the message. I mean, I read every word, like introduction. A. <laughs> you know, I read every single word on that paper, and I was through in five minutes. <laughs> I was done. I just wanted to get out of there, off of that stage, and out of that building. And so I start down. I get about two steps down, and one of the elders is sitting on the front row, and he stands up and holds up his hand. And I thought, I'm not stopping. I don't know what he's holding his hand up about, but I'm out of here. But when I got to that third step, I knew why he stood up. I was out of lapel wire. And it almost jerked me down. I mean, that thing was wired to the pulpit. And it had been there a while. And I didn't want to be there any longer. And I ran out of court, like jerked me down, and now I'm really humiliated. <laughs> now I not only didn't do the outline I practice all month, but now I have made a fool out of myself. And they're very gentle, you know, they get me unwound and, and stand me up enough, you know, they can take it off of me. And you probably have noticed even while I'm speaking, even when we laugh, uh, I light up like a candle. And now that I don't have any hair, if I, if I get embarrassed, I mean, I am just red all over. And so I am so red all over my body, I can feel the sweat dripping off my fingers. And I thought, I know what will never, ever, ever, ever happen again. I am not going to be in a public setting. Uh, if I'd had my way, I'd been one of them back row sitters. You know what I mean? I'll come in when everybody's seated, and I'll leave before they get up. And I would have been a really good one of those at that moment. But you know, they made me go to the back because I was one of the two speakers. And we had to shake hands with everybody when they came out. And ladies, I, I say this honestly and kindly. I know you wouldn't purposely lie. <laughs> but they came out and they worded it so they'd say, we're so proud of you. I mean, we're so glad you're willing to do that, and you just stay after it. Oh, you'd make a good preacher one of these days, and after a while, you know, you think, well, maybe. Yeah, it wasn't so bad after all. You know, nobody mentioned the microphone. You know, they just said, we're just so proud of you, and some of the little old ones get you by the cheek, you know, and they just say, we're just so sweet, we're so proud of you. That took a lot of courage. And I thought, yeah, it won't happen again. You don't have to worry about courage being used with me in that pulpit. And I'll tell you that story to put us in the context of this social anxiety. Well, I can tell you that brought it back to the surface. I didn't want to be in a crowd, and I sure wasn't going to speak in the presence of a crowd. And when you look at this excessive fear over these social situations, when you're told Social distance, social distance, social distance. What does that sound like to you? Yeah, be in a crowd. You might catch COVID if you're in a crowd. Got to reduce your crowd. Can't have over 50 in a crowd. Can't have more than 10 in a crowd. Can't get in a crowd. So people who never, ever really experienced social anxiety, never had a fear of being gathered with folks, now there's that little question mark. Is it safe? I know that restaurant's open, but should I go? Well, if another family invites us, should we go with them? We're going to sit at the same table? You see the different mindset? Now you and I kind of relate to somebody that's conscious all the time. How many people are going to be there? How could I leave without being noticed if I'm not comfortable there? You see, people who struggle with social anxiety have to plan ahead of time. How do I get in and out? 
of the doctor's office when there are a lot of other people sitting around? How do I go to the grocery store when I might run into a number of people that I know? I counseled with a lady when I was in Memphis and she had severe social anxiety. And we had to work on that for months and months. It turned into years. What would be very, very simple to you? She had to really plan ahead. And we had to start out with saying, well, just, just drive to the grocery store. And if you can get out and go in, wonderful. If you can't, just sit there in the parking lot and say, okay, you know, the mayonnaise and mustard will be on this aisle and the cereals on this aisle. And you just, in your mind, you go in the store and you walk around and you purchase the items. And you make a list of those as you're going to purchase those. You write down what aisle they're going to be on. And if you just can't do it, then you go back home and you get your daughter, got a teenage daughter. You get your daughter and you go back to the grocery store. You give her the list. You tell her what aisle those are on. And she can go pick up the item for us. And you think, that is ridiculous. <laughs> grocery store. Go get your groceries. But in her mind, she had that anxiety of a, there are a lot of other people buying groceries and, and they're going to ask me a question and, and I'm going to have to engage and I just I, I can't do that. And she'd paralyze her. I see her real often at, at functions when when we, we share things together or do when I go to Memphis. And she was able to master that. It took little baby steps of getting exposed to that feeling, working her way through taking care of that matter in a way that she's ordered, she's planned, and she gets in and out. Even to the point where we got where we could say, she said, well, you know, everybody in the area, everybody in the church shops there, and oh boy, and if they just, they bring up the conversation, you know, I just don't know what I'll do. And so we talk about what, what would you do? What might be something you could do to be polite and disengage and carry on the conversation in a more private setting. Now that was methodical. I mean, that was weeks of just walking through that so that she could practice on me to say, um, really good to see you. Uh, I have an appointment and can we talk later? She wasn't lying. Because you know what she did when she got home? I told you I'd run into her. She'd call me. She had an appointment to call me and say, this is what I experienced. And this is what I did about it. And you and I say, well, you know, man, I go to the grocery store. In fact, my wife and I call it our pantry. We're just a, a block from the grocery store. So we, we moved into the houses we're in. It, the, it belongs to the church. And so they had this little bitty uh, pantry. I don't know if they just... Thought preachers weren't going to need much food or what, but there's a little bitty pantry. And the house we moved from in Alabama, you know, had one of those walk in, like little small piggly wiggly like <laughs> pantries, you know? And so she got this little small pantry. She said, oh, I, don't, I don't want to complain, but wow, you know? And I said, Look at it this way. Noted the counselor coming out in me. I said, Look at it this way. You need something? Just call me at the office. On my way home, I'll run by the pantry. We've got this huge pantry. It's called Brookshire's. And we've got everything you could imagine. You just say, could you run by the big pantry and pick up something for me? And so we worked that out. So that's not a big deal for us. We don't have that anxiety of saying, what if I ran into somebody and had to carry on a conversation, had to be social in the grocery store? But that lady did. Now, you and I know that every interaction we have, there's a little question mark. How many people are going to be there? You may even have that thought about this gathering in this seminar. Are the tables going to be spread out? All right, you know, so and so is going to be there and they like to hug and I ain't at the hugging mood yet. You know what I mean? I still like that social distance. My wife would tell you, 
Uh, she's not a hugger. And so during this pandemic, she's like, yes. <laughs> you know, because she's a preacher's wife. And everybody's like, oh, I love you so much. And she's like, okay, okay, okay. And she's like, nobody can hug me. I can go anywhere I want to go. Nobody is going to hug me. In fact, I might just act like I'm going to hug them and see what they do. You know, it's one of those situations where she doesn't really warm up to that. Now, in case you're wondering, she doesn't mind me hugging her. You know, we, we have a really good relationship, so don't read anything into that. But she's just not a social person when it comes to that. But you can know those of us who are, and I'm one of 11, so you got hugged whether you wanted to or not. And so that's just the way it is in my family. And so I treat the spiritual family that way. You know, I'm, I'm a hugger. I usually get permission before I hug on folks, but uh, I just saw a, a close friend of mine and I hugged him. Um, that's who I am and what I do. But I will say during this pandemic, I did. I should. And here's what I've noticed since those restrictions have been eased. We still are a little cautious about that. I watch people in, in Bible class, they move a chair over a little bit. And we don't have the, the ropes up anymore that separates the pews, but some of them sit there like you've got a rope up there. Why is that? Ah. Oh. Social distance, social distance, social distance, social anxiety, this fear of being in a crowd. Now we understand. Now we say, yeah, but, you know, we've been told not to. Well, their minds have told them not to. That's been programmed into them, but you, you can't survive there. Boy, you're going you're gonna to find yourself over your head if you get in a crowd now. All of a sudden, people are going to start asking you questions, and you're going to be ill-prepared to do that. And so if that happens over a six-month period of time, and that fear is out of proportion to the actual threat posed by the social situation. When counseling with folks, I don't start with this, but somewhere during the counseling, we get to the point, and I'll say, okay, worst-case scenario, you run into that person, multiple people at the grocery store. What's the worst that could happen? Oh well. Oh, what do you mean? What's the worst that could happen? Well, you, you're afraid of that. that. That causes you great anxiety. What do you think will happen? And sometimes they find it difficult to say, well, this would happen. And sometimes they say, oh, I just die. I say, would you? I think I would. I mean, you just physically die? Well, probably not physically die, but I wish I'd be it. Somebody better move back there. The light went out. And, uh, uh, I know when you go to sleep now, when you get really still, the light's going to go off, and I'm going to get louder. Just be ready for it. I'm going to move this up to my first chin. And so you'll know I'm focused on you. And so we work through that. And then say, well, I, I wouldn't physically die. And then what would happen? Well, I'd just break out in sweat. Okay. If you break out in sweat, they'd see the sweat. I guarantee they'd see it. It'd be dripping off my nose. I'd be so anxious. Say, well, can you carry a handkerchief with you? Maybe we we'll just take care of that. We work through that little by little. Now you and I know it can be a little bit of a struggle to walk into a gathering like this and just sit down next to a person and have a conversation. They want to shake hands with you. Well, you know, we've kind of been waving for a few months. We at least back to the fist bump, but I'm not really to the full handshake yet. I mean, we have really had that experience, haven't we? We're kind of at the point in my congregation where um, I didn't even try to shake hands or anything. We just had it built in where we just, we know we're here and why we're here and we're glad we're here and we're not going to have that contact because we don't want to endanger each other and we just did that. Now, you know, some people just can't wait to shake hands with you and, and other people kind of wave at you. If you start shaking hands with them, they're like, oh, 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 you know, don't want to go there yet. Well, that's okay. What that tells me is now you know what social anxiety feels like. 
So let's take that understanding and say, boy, I am going to be more empathetic to people who have to really work through this every day because I'm having to work through this. And I want to make sure that I don't ever abandon anybody like that that needs somebody to keep that distance and yet be connected to them. And not make fun of them, but participate with them. And maybe build up enough relationship with them that you can go shopping with them. And you can kind of be that buffer so that they don't get caught and don't have to carry on that, that conversation. So that's, that's the social anxiety part. And there's 15 million adults of men and women who are affected by social anxiety. That's a big chunk of folks, isn't it? So now it's kind of been brought to the surface. We know how it feels and realize that in our families, in our congregations, in our community, in our schools, there have been people all along who struggle with that. Let's find ways to nurture them. I'm certainly more empathetic to young men who get up and speak and and because I went through some of those experiences and say, look, when you get to the point where you've got something to say and you realize what you've got to say is so important for people to hear that you can overcome your own fears, then you get to the point where it doesn't control you, you control it. I still have to prepare myself to deal with it. But you need to have this discussion with me this weekend and you can't do that if I'm not present with you if you didn't overcome your fears of being a symbol and if I didn't overcome my fear of getting up and speaking to a crowd then we couldn't have this discussion panic attacks or something maybe you've never experienced but notice when we say panic disorder, we're talking again about a pattern, a, an abrupt surge of intense fear or discomfort that reaches a peak within minutes. And this is a repeated pattern. It happens over a period of time. It's paralyzing. You see the heart starts pounding and you start sweating and shaking and you have shortness of breath and choking and chest pains and nausea and dizziness and chills and and numbness and tingling, derealization, fear of losing control or dying. Hmm. Let me get, tell you a, a personal story. Right after I became dean at Amherst University, um, my younger sister called. She lives in Texas and uh, near College Station. <clears throat> and she's a nurse. So she's a medical person and she dealt with all these things. Really strong person. Been through a lot of, a lot of difficulties in life. <clears throat> and so uh, kind of one of those people that you'd go to if, if uh, you needed somebody to bring order and calmness to your life because she's brought order and calmness to her life and just an impressive person. And she calls me and she's distraught. And, uh, you know, when you're one of 11 children and you happen to have a counseling degree, so you just have to answer the phone for free counseling advice. You know, it's like, well, I know you, you can't be my counselor, but what would you do if? But this was a little different. She wasn't asking for a friend. She was panic-stricken. She said, I don't know what's happening to me. I just, and she described all these symptoms, you know. And I said, well, you have all the symptoms of having a panic attack. What's going on? Nothing going on abnormal in her marriage. Not, nothing abnormal going on in her family. She was a, a school counselor. And nothing abnormal going on in school other than a normal kind of, of crisis situation to go on. But she's handled hundreds and hundreds of those. They had to call the ambulance three times. Thought she was dying. So here's what we had to do. I said, look, you know, that's not you. That's not normally how you respond, but you have all the symptoms. And so what happens when people have a panic attack, their adrenal gland dumps all this adrenaline in and it's, it's used, supposed to be used for you to run from danger. 
or if you back in the corner just to fight your way out. I mean, it's dumped and you've got to use it. But if it gets dumped when there's no crises and your body is trying to process that and there's no fear or no danger to run from, there's no one standing there that you need to fight. Your body's trying to process all that adrenaline and it feels like it's going to bust out of your chest. So you think you're having a heart attack. And so I said, the first thing you need to do is go to a medical doctor and let them see if there's something going on medically. She did. And guess what? There was a tumor on her adrenal gland that was causing it to malfunction and just dump that adrenaline in there. And all of a sudden, she had all those symptoms. Now, if you didn't try to process that and, and try to say, what's the best for this person? You might want to be, I'll be the best counselor in the world. My sister's going to be impressed. Like, here's what we do to handle panic attacks. So let's take some breathing exercises Oh, sit with your feet on, and I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying, if you didn't pay attention, you'd be trying to do those things you think you need to do, even from a professional standpoint, and you'd be ignoring what's really going on. But I might say you, you put both your feet on the floor, you sit up straight, you have your back straight, you just close your eyes and take a deep breath. She would have thrown a phone through the TV or something at me. They'll be telling me to calm down. I'm telling you, I'm dying of a heart attack. So I did tell you, here's some things you can do. Just, just think it through. And so they had a, a medical doctor and they got an appointment early the next morning. They went in and they were able to discover through x-rays and uh, tear grounds and those kind of things, there is a, a small tumor on the adrenal gland. Went in and did surgery. Remove the tumor. It was benign. No more panic attacks. But if a person has those feelings and all the medical things have been eliminated, and here's a, a, a psychological fear that gets triggered and that adrenaline gets dumped and they have all these symptoms. I had a client in Alabama who's... Uh, had been molested as a child. So there's certain terms that could be said, certain behaviors from people, because she had an uncle who molested her. And there were certain approaches that he would make to her and kind of grooming her for his pleasure. And so if anybody were polite in that way, totally innocently polite and telling her she was pretty or any of the common terms that her uncle would have used, she'd have a panic attack. All these symptoms you're talking about. Sometimes in session, just trying to go back and, and put that in a bright perspective and say, look, you're not that child anymore. You're a grown woman. Do not let your uncle molest you anymore. Don't give him another day of your life. But you see, you can't just tell her that. Look, he can't get to you now. She'd experience that, and, and boy, there would be trickers. And her husband's like, hey, I don't know what to do. You know, boy, sometimes when I'm thinking I'm just embracing her and comforting her, it just sends her into a panic attack. And she really thought she'd die. And the last time she had one in my presence, uh, he called me from the parking lot and said, you got to come out here. She was in the midst of a panic attack. Just coming to the session, we'd gotten to a particular stage in the session, she knew what her homework had been processed, she knew we were going to talk about that, and just about to open the car door, and all the symptoms flooded her. I had to go and get her husband let the window down and just busy with her through the window, work our way through it. See, I've never really bodily, physically 
had that experience. Most of us haven't. But boy, with the 27, the 24-7 news cycle of the dangers out there, everybody might die. Where nobody's safe. Well, you can't go anywhere. Boy, if you go to the hospital, it's likely you're going to be put on a vent and you're not coming back. And it was just bombarding us. You know what happened to a lot of people who had never, ever experienced any of these symptoms before? They had panic attacks. I had preachers, elders, preachers' wives, elders' wives, experience these things. Because it was just so overwhelming. And they thought, what would happen to my kids if something happened to me? Well, we, we would all ask that question somewhere along the way, but that was a constant question to them. What would happen to my children if, 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 if I had to go in? So I've got to make sure I not only wash my hands, but I've got to wash off everything that comes through that door. And every time the child leaves the room and comes back out, I've got to wash them down, and they just get absolutely obsessed. And if somebody breaks that protocol, they have a full-fledged, heart-pounding, sweat-dripping panic attack. Now, we know how it feels, don't we? Now we've either experienced it ourselves or we've sat next to people that we've always admired who seem to have it all together who now think they're dying. And particularly if they had any of the symptoms of COVID, what do you think happened to them? Oh my, I didn't taste that blackberry cobbler when I just took that bite. I might have COVID if I do. I might be put on a vent and I may not come home. What's going to happen to my children? All those things triggered and here we go. You see, from a distance we can say, look, 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 pay attention here. You want the light to stay on, so everybody pay attention here. Here's what we do. But see, that's a, a good time for us to say, you know, we might enter something like this again where we get shut down and we're kind of isolated. What have we learned? And how can we take that immediate circumstance and talk out loud with the knowledge that we now have to make sure that we help each other navigate through this and that we don't get into those kind of situations? And... Never, ever, ever again. Make light of anyone who has a panic attack. It's embarrassing for them. If they have a full-fledged meltdown out in the foyer because somebody mentioned something about their loved one who was killed in some tragic way and all of a sudden... You know, they're laying out on the floor and we're having to call an ambulance. He's like, well, that's just excessive, isn't it? They need to get a life and pull themselves together, shouldn't they? Now I hope we understand that these are real symptoms. And yes, they can be addressed and they should be addressed. Sometimes they can be addressed with therapy. Sometimes they have to be addressed with medication. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But 19 million adults suffer from a specific phobia of some sort. And usually it began at an early age. It's not unlike, unlikely, uh, not unusual, I should say, for uh, someone maybe at uh, the age of seven to experience something. And from then on, there's this phobia they have. And when that's triggered, these symptoms appear. May you and I be more empathetic to say, I don't want to just have a conversation with them when they collect themselves. When we're just having each other in each other's home to say, look, you don't have to share your private business with me, but if there's some way that I could be of assistance, if there's some way that you could give me some knowledge that would help you and prevent that from happening, or if it is happening, for me to be there for you, how would I do that? 
Don't assume you know how to do that. But now we ought to know we ought to be available for that. To be able to help them deal with that psychological moment in our life. My sister is highly functioning. Um, hasn't had any more panic attacks since that the tumor was removed. But boy, is she empathetic to any of her patients that suffers with panic attacks, with panic disorder. She tunes in. She is patient, kind, present in those things. It's important for us to <clears throat> recognize that. <clears throat> I thought the, the picture on the screen um, kind of captured it. <laughs> You know, it's like, this is it. Um, Fred Sanford would say, I'm coming, Liz. You know, this is, this is it's all over from here. I, I can't handle it. It's going to blow the whole system. Um, I hope that we will benefit from that. After we come back from, from our break, our lunch break, we'll transition a little bit into the depression discussion. You and I kind of use that interchangeably. We say anxiety and depression, and maybe we don't make any distinction in our mind. There are distinctions that need to be made. We're not going to cover all the aspects on either one of those, but hopefully we will have covered enough that you have a working knowledge of terminology and behavior and symptoms and ways that they could be addressed. It would make us better husbands and wives and better parents and, and better siblings and better neighbors and friends and just better people because we've learned some valuable things and we're never going back. We're never going to isolate ourselves again. We're never going to look at people from a distance and say, well, that's really sad. We're going to say, hey, I've lived in that environment. I know how that feels. And I want them to know they will never, ever be alone in that experience again. I'll be present. And as uncomfortable as it is for all of us, we're going to share that discomfort so that we come through it okay. Appreciate your attentive nature. You kept the lights on almost the whole time this time. Mm -hmm.